Right, well, good morning. Welcome today. We are uh, glad you're here. Um, and what a, uh, the summer has come to a close. And school is starting uh, this week, and it's going to be, but it's actually going to feel like summer. <laughs> so be praying for all the kids that are out uh, practicing and things like that this week. Um, and uh, I got to see Nate yesterday, uh, went by and saw him, and uh, man, he's recovering really well. It's a long process uh, for him, so keep praying for him, and uh, he's, uh, he's on the road to recovery. So um, I'll go through a few announcements this morning. Um, first of all, we have a guest speaker today, uh, and Justin will introduce him later, uh, Kevin Ingram. If you didn't come down to Sunday school, he's a president of Manhattan Christian College, and uh, he's here to, to uh, deliver the message today, but also uh, gave us an update on, uh, on Manhattan Christian College earlier. So he'll have a booth out here, so please do stop and talk to him uh, after the service. Um, also, there's a greeter meeting. If you're interested in being a greeter or door opener, uh, we'd love to have more people out there saying hi to people, opening doors, and that type of thing. Uh, there's a meeting directly after uh, this service. It, actually, almost directly after this service. We're going to have a baptism after the service. So if you please would just stick around in there um, uh, while we do that. We'll have that meeting after that. Um, also, uh, uh, Operation Christmas Child, if you're looking here, um, that the, uh, the school bus, uh, we are taking school supplies this month uh, for, um, for them. Uh, also, Awanas, the registration starts next Sunday, and it will go uh, that next week. Uh, promotion Sunday is next Sunday, um, so we'll do that during this service. Um, and the church picnic is also that evening at Elmwood Park. Also, uh, there is a parent uh, meeting for middle and high school kids on August 30th. And if you still would like to get into Rooted, please let me know. I'd love to get you in. I'm have to order books soon, so um, do let me know this week. Also, Throwback Sunday, uh, remember, September 10th, we're going back to 1967. So if you still have stuff from 1967, some of you, you know, you can dress that way, although I'm about to find that, uh, those, that stuff. Uh, but Daryl Boston and his family came to Norton Christian Church in 1967. Uh, he's a Manhattan graduate. And uh, we're going to be celebrating them that day, and he's going to be preaching. So we'll have lots of fun. Um, remember the baby shower for Embrace Grace is in here. Also the paint war uh, that's going on for the, uh, the youth. Just also a change. The uh, uh, worship night I, on the slide is not, uh, it's not the 22nd. It's the 21st. It's tomorrow night, Monday night uh, here, um, uh, right, right, right in here. So anyway, um, hey, we have a video real quick uh, for a Sunday school that's going to be starting uh, for uh, uh, early Sunday school, like at 730 in the morning on September 3rd. Phil Henderson is going to be doing a uh, men's Bible study. So here's here's a quick clip for that. We are inviting any man whose heart is willing and courageous to join us in this resolution. In my home, the decision has already been made. You don't have to ask who will guide my family, because by God's grace, I will. I do solemnly resolve before God to take full responsibility for myself, my wife, and my children. I will love them, protect them, serve them, and teach them the Word of God. As the spiritual leader of my home, I will be faithful to my wife, to love and honor her, and be willing to lay down my life for her, as Jesus Christ did for me. I will bless the children and teach them to love God with all their hearts, all their minds, and with all of their strength. I will train them to honor authority and live responsibly. I will confront evil, pursue justice, and love mercy. I will pray for others and treat them with kindness, respect, and compassion. I will work diligently to provide for the needs of my family. I will forgive those who have wronged me and reconcile with those I have wronged. I will learn from my mistakes, repent of my sins, and walk with integrity as a man answerable to God. I will seek to honor God, be faithful to His church, obey His word, and do His will. I will courageously work with the strength God provides to fulfill this resolution, to fulfill this resolution, to fulfill this resolution, to fulfill this resolution for the rest of my life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. I am courageous. Dad, because of you, I will be courageous.
Okay, that will be uh, on September 3rd. I will start at 7.30 in the morning for any men that are interested in that class. Um, if you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Actually, before I do that, if somebody lost any keys, these are in the men's bathroom. That was a short walk. That's good. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, our reading today is from Psalm 1. How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season, and whose leaf does not wither. Uh, whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like the chaff in the wind that blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praising your name no matter what comes Cause I know where I'd be without your mercy So I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs I can count the times I've called your name some broken night You showed up and passed me up like you do everything
see my victory seems like we want to fight it, but we just need to let you fight it for us. We just praise you, and we just give you honor and glory because we have you. We thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Jesus, 
start exactly like I did in first service. I'm praying that every one of you feels especially welcome here this morning. We're thankful for all of you. We started re-watching The Chosen several nights ago, and it's just like the scriptures. Every time you see it, you learn something different. And uh, there was a line in one of the episodes that has really stuck out to me lately, the last few days. Jesus is walking down a path with some of the Chosen, and one of the disciples asked him, 
Why did you answer a person like you did earlier today? Why did you use those words in, in answering his question? And Jesus' comment to the disciple was, well, those were simple words for a complicated people. And we are a complicated people, but do you agree the simpler the answers, the better most of the time? And I think we're fortunate here at Norton Christian Church. I've never gone home after a service wondering what the minister was trying to get across. We, we are preached to in terms that we can understand. But this chosen series or episode reminded me of something I'd seen just prior to that. There was a pastor on television. He'd been approached by one of his congregation about a situation that he was in. And as he closed uh, explaining to the pastor, he said, but I don't want to take the easy way out. And the pastor said, well, that's kind of a prideful remark. And he said, pride really is a problem that we have and it'll separate us from our relationship with the Lord and with other people. And if you think back, Melvin, or Lucas Melvin had a communion meditation earlier this summer, and he touched on pride being one of the seven deadly sins. And just two weeks ago in our Sunday school class, Garrett touched on pride being something that can be extremely detrimental. But anyway, getting back to what the pastor said to this person, they said, why don't you want to take the easy way out? Because to me, taking the easy way out is simply confessing your sin, proclaiming that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, repenting, and getting on with your life. And I thought that was said so well, and I was ready to stop this meditation right here. Then Nate comes along in a couple weeks, and he preaches a sermon that says, we've got to have more than a touchy-feely relationship with our Lord. And I thought that's true, and there have been times when people uttered a confession of sin and a proclamation of faith that they didn't really mean what they were saying, and you could tell by their actions that nothing had changed in them. So, so whether it's your confession of sin and proclamation of faith, or whether it's taking these sacraments that we're going to take this morning, there be, needs to be a huge dose of sincerity along those lines. So I just hope that you'll remember that, and I hope that you'll remember uh, simple words for a complicated people. Let's pray. Father, we come to you thankful this morning for everyone here, and we're thankful for the things you do for us every day. Lord, we receive uh, peace, and we receive strength, and we receive guidance from you. And we ask these things for every person here and every person in this community who is open to your word. We just ask you to lift them up. Be with us as we start a new week, Father. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen.
pray with me, please. Father God, we come to you today thankful, Lord, for another day, Lord. Thank another day to do your will, Lord, and to walk in your way, to worship in your house freely with friends and family. Lord, we just ask that you help us to fight our battles and that you burn like a fire inside of us. Lord, please use this offering to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Cindy. At this time, uh, Children's Church, well, you can uh, head to Little Tykes in extended session. Kids Quest can go line up uh, outside by the stairs to go down for your session. A um, couple announcements for youth ministry related things. Tonight is our paint war night down at Elmwood Park at 6 o'clock. Um, dr dress in uh, some shorts and a t shirt that you can get wet, you can get uh, colored powder on. Do not wear your school clothes, you know. Um, to, to the park tonight, you'll regret that. And maybe bring an extra towel so that when mom or dad comes and picks you up tonight, uh, you don't uh, paint the car, the inside of the car. All the powder and paint is washable, but just to be extra, you know, bring an extra towel or something to have them sit on on the way home. So that's gonna be at six o'clock tonight at Elmwood for middle school and high school students. Uh, come on down, we'll have some food and some good, good time. Uh, parent meeting August 30th at the Rock at 7 o'clock, and there's a meeting that we've added also on the 30th at 6.30 here at the church. If you are working with our WANA Kids Ministry, or if you're thinking about wanting to work with the WANA or teach Sunday school or do anything related with children up through our students, we have a, a training, if you did not do it last year, uh, here uh, with Julie Douglas at 6.30 on the 30th. Um, if that's a conflict for you, if you're a parent of a, of a teenager, just come talk to me and we'll work something out. But, uh, but that meeting is going to be on the 30th at 6.30 for all Awana workers. Now, if you, again, if you did that training last year, you don't have to do it this year, just so you, so you know. Okay. Um, our speaker today is uh, Kevin Ingram, president from Manhattan Christian College. And Kevin's going to come bring the word today. And we got to have supper last night. And he got a chance to speak this morning uh, in our early service and down in Sunday school hour. So if you would um, keep the Manhattan Christian College in your prayers, their students start classes tomorrow. And uh, keep him in your prayers as he's traveling around speaking and, and doing everything that a president does to keep the college running. So would you give him a big uh, Norton welcome as he can and preach the word. Thank you. He said a mouthful, doing everything a president does. I would love to know what his perception is that everything a president does. It is a lot. It is so good to be with you all. It's been too long since I've been to Norton, Kansas. And so it is a thrill to be back with you. And uh, I'll just confess, uh, several people have said, you don't look like yourself. And, uh, you know, they've even asked, you know, I hope this is a good thing. Yes, it is a good thing. I, my wife and I have both lost a lot of weight in the last year and a half intentionally it wasn't unintentional what's funny is the older you are the more apt people are to say now that's a good thing right yes it is a good thing uh, we did it intentionally i'm going to slide this down i hope that doesn't creak because i can't see you if that's right there and is you you may not want to see me tell me where to put it we can put it right there that's good. 
That's good. It is great to be with y'all, and it's always a thrill. I say this often and think back. It always brings back memories for me coming back to Norton uh, because my first three years of ministry were in Oakley, Kansas. And so that was when we were still doing Fifth Sunday rallies. It's when we were having camp meetings, and uh, we would just do a variety of things and would come up to Norton every few months. And uh, it was always a privilege to come up here. I often think back. I had uh, breakfast with uh, Daryl Boston this morning, early this morning, and it's always great to see Daryl. I'm glad y'all are celebrating him here in a few weeks. And um, just thinking back to where, before I went to Oakley, one of the churches I'd applied at my senior year was Norton, Kansas. And uh, I ended up going to Oakley. Jeff Nielsen came here. He and I did camp together, have a lot of great memories, and that's a whole lot of other stories uh, that we can talk about later. But it's great to be with you. And let me say this, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. This coming September 12th, MCC will celebrate 96 years of existence. And one of the many reasons we've been able to be in existence that long, and especially if you know other Bible colleges and what's going on in the college world these last few years, several of our Bible colleges closing, and we've been able to exist that long because of the many faithful partners we have in Norton Christian Church, and many of the couples in this church are some of those faithful partners. So thank you so very much. Uh, we couldn't do what we do to train up the next generation of Christian leaders if it weren't for your partnership, so I will say thank you. Uh, but I'm here to preach, so I'm going to keep going, and I would love to tell you more, but you should have been at Sunday school downstairs, and you could have heard more. Uh, but, um, but I'm here to fill the pulpit, so let me get to preaching. Uh, I recently took a sabbatical for a month. Uh, I've been in uh, ministry. Uh, I was ordained into ministry in 1983, March 13th of 83, so last March I celebrated 40 years. Hard to believe it's been 40 years. Uh, the next week I started preaching, March 20th in Elmdale Christian Church. So I've been preaching for over 40 years, and you may be at the end of my sermon going, uh, he hadn't gotten any better in 40 years. I don't know what his problem is. <laughs> but I've been preaching for 40 years, and I've never taken a sabbatical. Uh, I've never taken any time off. Darrell was in the first service, and I remembered asking him and my father-in-law and Wayne Pittman, guys who had been in ministry for eons, and I asked them, you know, when have you ever taken a sabbatical? And Darrell's answer was, I don't know what a sabbatical is. The sabbatical is going to the North American Christian Convention, or a sabbatical is preaching a revival at another church. And I took a month, the month of June, uh, out of office. I think I only received one call from the college in that same time frame and just spent time with my wife and family and spent time with God. And it was really an incredible time for me. And if you want to see the pictures, I'll share them with you. I'd be love to share with you the pictures because we had an incredible time uh, being able to spend time. And we finished it with a cruise with our kids and grandkids. And that's what my wife wanted for our 40th anniversary and had a great time. But while I was on that month, I usually read uh, novels. I, I don't read fiction often. I read it on my vacation and that's it. And I had took three novels with me and I didn't even open them. And it's because I dug into the book Resilient out of one of many books. And it's written by John Eldridge. And in that book, the, it said, the underlying theme is restoring your weary soul in these turbulent times. And I thought, you know, I'm taking a sabbatical. If I want it to be refreshing, maybe I ought to read a book like this. And I read the book, and the underlying theme that he brought up this whole book was the pandemic hit us all so hard. And he said, in fact, we were prepared to be steamrolled. We were set up to be steamrolled by a pandemic in 2020. A pandemic that hit our nation so hard, a pandemic that hit churches so hard, a pandemic that hit people so hard, a pandemic that just kind of steamrolled us. And I've thought a lot about that and thought about the depth of it. And it's made me wonder as I went through that month, what did COVID reveal about Americans and specifically about American Christians? And here's some of the thoughts I've had. For one, it shows us the shallowness of technology, which is supposed to keep us connected yet it's only one dimensional and adds no depth to our life and our communication. It's only one dimensional. We can't see faces. We can't see body language. We can't see, even if we're doing it by, uh, by Zoom or we're doing it through FaceTime, you don't get the whole package. It revealed how much we like to be in control and how little we truly are in control. Am I right? It revealed what's really important in life and what we truly have put our importance in, which really isn't important. It revealed how lacking our relationships really are. It revealed our reserves mentally, emotionally, and spiritually are pretty shallow, and we don't have the reserves to be able to handle something like that, and so we were steamrolled. 
It revealed that there are three types of poverty, not just material poverty. There's material poverty, there's spiritual poverty, and there's relational poverty in our world. And it revealed the lack of commitment to church in Christ, and churches have suffered. As I travel around, it's rare to be in a church building this full anymore. It's because so many people stepped away during COVID and they never came back. So many people, we even had a friend of ours, we saw her in the grocery store. Oh, great to see you. We've been missing you at church. She goes, well, I'm just not comfortable being in crowds anymore. And I looked around and I'm like, you're in the grocery store? But you can't come to church? I didn't say that, of course. We were in the tomato section. I might have had a tomato thrown at me. But it revealed so much. It revealed uh, something that I think is interesting, regular attendance anymore. When a person says in a poll, I regularly attend church, that means they attend irregularly, regularly. The average person in America today attends church a little over once a month. And they consider that regular attendance. It revealed so much. We were set up to be steamrolled, but we shouldn't be surprised. And one of the verses that stood out to me as I was studying all of this this summer was in Luke 21. And it says this in verse 34. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. Talking about uh, just the hard times that come in the end times. And he says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation. That is things that just naturally fall apart. Drunkenness, which is a part of that. And the anxieties of life. I had never noticed the phrase anxieties of life before. I had never noticed the anxieties of life that hit us so hard, that can weigh us down, that can burden us. The anxieties of life that include illness, that include death, that include economic challenges, that include political campaigns. I don't know about you, but I'm already tired of the next presidential election. I'm already tired of it, and we've even gotten to it. The anxieties of life like storms that seem to be growing in magnitude, hail that can wipe out a crop field, the challenges of 8.5% interest, which I remember when I moved to Great Bend to be the pastor, we were thrilled to have 12.5% interest. So I keep reminding myself of that. All of those anxieties that can push on us. We need greater resilience of our heart and souls. And I think part of the problem that this is revealed is revealed in Jeremiah chapter 2. One of the verses he points out in the book. Listen to it, verse 13. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And if anybody ought to understand what a cistern is, is people from western Kansas because it's the aquifer that runs underground that feeds what you do farming-wise, that feeds what you do. And you often hear and have heard it a lot lately that the level of that aquifer is lowering. Am I right? You understand what underground water does. You understand how it feeds and how it helps us do everything. And here's the illustration. Too many of us in our faith have walked away from the living water, which only comes from God himself, that restores who we are, that gives us reserves to handle the anxieties of life, and we've dug wells into water that doesn't even exist and can't give us what we ultimately need. That's why we were pan pan steamrolled by a pandemic. Because we try to draw sustenance and life from things which cannot even give us that life. So what are some things that I've learned personally as I've been on this journey of the last few months that I think we all can benefit from? And the first is understanding this. Understand the reality of life is the battle in life is for our heart and soul and not for our bodies. Understand that. Life may affect us physically, it may affect us mentally, it may affect us emotionally, yet the real battle is for our hearts and souls. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 10, listen to it. So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Why? Because that's what matters the most. I'm reminded often of when I, every, every funeral I go to, every funeral I do, of a phrase I heard 30 years ago of a funeral, and it was a son-in-law who shared it about one of the elders in Great Bend when I was a pastor there, and he had passed away, and it was this. The problem is, and this is a paraphrase, 
We live and act like we are physical beings that have temporary spiritual experiences. But the truth of the matter is we are spiritual beings who have a temporary physical experience. The old gospel quartet song said this, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And the reality of the pandemic is it revealed that so often we put more value and try to gain our identity in life from things of this world physically instead of from the other world eternally and spiritually. And that's the reality. The battle is for our souls. The loss of physical life rocked us as it should. The potential of the loss of physical life rocked us because it caused us to wonder. But what it did was it revealed what we feared most. And understand the reality, the battle in our world is not for our lives and physically, it's for our hearts and souls spiritually. Secondly, we need to repent and commit to never divide our lives again. And what I mean by this, we have to live in two realms. We as believers, we understand, we have accepted Christ, but we're living in this world. Jesus knew the potential when he said to his disciples in John 17, I've prayed that God would protect you in the middle of the world. I cannot take you out of the world because you have to live in the world, but I pray that you're not of the world and that God would protect you from the evil one. What was he saying was, we have to live in the world and be spiritual beings while we're living in the physical realm, but the problem is we've divided our lives. We've divided them and tried to gain too much from the physical realm. Then what we should. We have to live in them and enjoy them, but keep our priorities in place. And we need to repent when we do that. We need to say, I'm not looking at this world and what it can offer me. And let me remind you, 1 John 2 says this, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. And we too often divide our lives and gain too much identity and strength of who we are from the world, and we can't do that anymore. Because divided lives lead to divided hearts, which leads to worried hearts. And much of what we worry about hasn't happened yet and won't most likely even happen in the first place. So quit dividing our lives. We need to live in the world and not be of the world. And make sure we understand that truth. You see, the truth is, the less time we spend with Jesus, the danger we face is worshiping a Jesus we create. And the Jesus we need to worship is the one of the Word of God that is so clearly laid out. Another point I've learned is this. We need to release our anxieties to him. Because when we start to worry and we hold on to our anxieties, they begin to build and they begin to mushroom and they begin to snowball and our worries can become even worse. But we need to release them to him. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties on him. Not just some of them, not just the big ones, not just everything that's massive. Cast all of your anxieties upon him. If it's small enough for you to worry about, it's big enough for you to pray about. And lay all your anxieties upon him. When anxieties do rise, give them to God. Uh, Spurgeon even said this, My dear friend, when grief presses you to the dust, worship there. What did Job did when grief pressed him to the dust? He worshiped there. But the problem is, when we give our anxieties to God, I'm going to use my keys and, and remind me to pick them up so I don't leave them. We give our keys and we'll say, Okay, God, here's my anxiety. I give it to you, but what do we do? We still have it here. We can still grab it back. When we release our anxieties to God, we don't need to go palms up. We need to go palms down. Palms down. God, it's yours. It's not mine. When I think about MCC, I'm reminded, MCC is not mine. It is his. Norton Christian Church is not yours. It's his. And the only essential person in the church is Jesus Christ. And we need to release our anxieties to him and let him have them and quit worrying about them and make sure that he's in first place. In the book, there's one of the beautiful things he wrote, Psalm 23. And he said, this is one of the ways that we release it. And he says, let the word of God sink into your heart. And we'll talk about a little bit this and more in a minute. But listen to this reflection on the 23rd Psalm that he read. And it reads the Psalm and then gives a reminder. Listen to it. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Jesus is still in charge, still deeply involved in my life and world, guiding, leading, and providing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. 
He reminds us, God restores my weary heart. He gives me resilience if I follow him. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And he said, don't get baited into all the sociodrama. Let God lead me each and every day. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And he says, we are in a dark time, but God is still protecting and comforting me, and I'm not navigating this on my own. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. He reminds us, God has a feast of goodness for me, even in rough times. He fills my famished cravings. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And he adds, my reality is not determined by pandemics, politics, or anything else. I live in God. He lives in me. His goodness is with me today, and my future is absolutely wonderful because of that. That's the reality we need to live in. And cast all of our anxieties upon him. Another challenge would be this, to develop deep roots. You heard it in Psalm 1 as it was read this morning. Let me read it again. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. Develop deep roots. Reserves are re replenished when there's more coming in than going out. And the way that we need to build up our reserves to be able to handle the anxieties of life, we need to make sure that our roots are set in God and in God's word. And then God's word then becomes our filter to work all of life through. You see, the battle in our lives is for the narrative. And I want to ask you, what narrative are you reading? Are you reading this one or are you reading this one? The battle is for the narrative. Are we reading this one or are we reading this one? You see, when we're reading this one, we're listening to the voices of terrified sheep. When we're reading this one, we're listening to the voice of the good shepherd. What are we listening to? Deep roots and understanding it. God's word becoming our filter to work all of life's through. The world's narrative is unnerving and draining. God's narrative is powerful, hopeful, and eternal. You see, when we gain a piece of God's mind, it can give us peace of mind in the midst of an uncertain world. And so often, this is what we turn to. We flip through. It's developing deep roots. Again, you ought to understand it. I grew up in Alabama. There are trees everywhere. Because they get 75 to 80 inches of rain a year. Y'all haven't had that in that last decade, am I right? But there are trees in western Kansas. And it's usually at the bottom of the hill where the water goes down and settles. And the little bit of rain you get goes to the low spots. And so those seeds can survive in the low spots. Why? Because all of the water that falls, the little bit that falls on the hill settles in the bottom. And it feeds those roots so those trees can survive for decades. That's the illustration. That's Psalm 1. When our roots are in God's word, it gives us a resource that even when droughts hit and hard times hit and we get rocked by what's going on in the world, we've got roots in God's word that can sustain us through it all. Develop deep roots. And when you see a tree at the bottom of one of those valleys, remember it. Jesus said this in John 15, abide in me and I will abide in you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. He reminds us in that image in John 15, he's the vine and we are the branches. But the problem is we try to live as the vine and draw from everything in life and then our branches run dry. But when I remember my role and I'm a branch and he's the vine, he gives me the reserves to handle the anxieties of life and march through them moving ahead. Develop deep roots. And in case you're worried, I'm really going to get crazy here. This is my last point, so hang in there with me, okay? Focus on recovery. Let me explain. Recovery anymore in athletics is just as important as being in the game. Some of y'all know this. I get to be the chaplain for K-State football. 
and I get to see behind the scenes of what they do, and it's fascinating to me. We were in Houston for the Texas Bowl, and that was when I was a little closer and got to be involved because on a trip I have nothing else to do uh, but to be around the team. And it was 95 degrees that December in Houston and 95% humidity, and it was really hitting hard, and the guys were working hard. And over in the corner of the field at University of Houston Stadium were these big black tanks. And there was a whole wall of ice. And about 30 minutes before practice was over, they filled those tanks with ice and filled them with water. And they told every player, you have to spend at least five or 10 minutes in that tank of ice. And I'm thinking, I'm hot, but I'm not that hot. I don't need to go into a tank of ice. You know what it was about? The recovery of their muscles. They have Normatec boots, they do stretching, they do exercises, they work. Why? Because they've learned that recovery is just as important as the exercise. Working out is important, but recovering from that so our muscles can continue to rebuild and we have faster recovery and be ready to play. And because of that, focus on recovery. And that sets the stage for this. In Mark chapter 1, as Jesus was beginning his ministry, it says this, that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Now I've had busy days, but never one this busy. Never. I went to the office at six, uh, Friday morning, we started enrollment. We had an event that night, so I was in the office from 6 and left at 7.30. It was a long, full day. But I haven't had an evening like this, where the whole, all the sick and demon-possessed were brought to the door. The whole town was outside, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. That was a busy day. But he's the Son of Man, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. But listen to verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. I've been convicted about that verse for 30 years. 30 years ago, I was in a men's group. We met at 6 o'clock Tuesday morning for Bible study at, um, at a, a gentleman in the church who owned an eye, an ear hearing aid facility at the hearing aid center. We'd meet for Bible study and we would study a chapter of the Bible and when we studied Mark 1, we memorized a verse and the verse we chose to memorize was verse 35 and here's how we memorized it. Very early in the morning, while I am still asleep, Jesus got up and departed and went to a lonely place and was praying there. Here's the question. If the Son of God, the Son of Man, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God needed time with the Father early in the morning, do you think you do? Do you think I do? When the anxieties of life hit me, I need him. When the pressures of this life hit me, I need him. When death hits me in the face, I need him. When illness hits me in the face, I need him. When pandemics hit us, we need him. When politics hit us, we for sure need him. Doesn't matter what life throws us. We need him. So if we're going to have the reserves to continue to live in this world and be effective as believers, to continue to stand strong against the tide that's working against us, to continue to make sure we're standing firm and we are faithful, continuing on in the work of the Lord, we've got to focus on recovery. When life gets hectic and our homes get hectic, the problem is, I've already said it, we often withdraw to our phones or we withdraw to TV. Oh, that early in the morning, we would depart to a lonely place and pray there and focus on him. And the truth of the matter is we don't lose time spending it with God. We gain eternity. Why? Because we're spiritual beings who happen to be having a temporary physical experience. And we need to focus on that. Jeremiah 2, I want to go back to that text. And it's fascinating to me to, to look at this passage. Because in verse 5, I read verse 13 to you already, the broken cisterns that we dig for ourselves that don't even hold water, but we try to draw living water from. 
But in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5, it says this. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols. And the result? They became worthless themselves. How does the world view the church right now? I think worthless might be one of the words. If we're more connected with the world than we are with the, with the Lord, we might be. Because we're not offering our world what it really needs. Our world needs living water. Our world needs water that'll sustain. Our world needs water that'll fill their souls, that'll help them look at pandemics in the face and politics in the face and our world <coughs> in the face and weather in the face and illness in the face and Ill, Ill, death in the face and know that there is hope because our hope is found in Jesus Christ and his hope never disappoints. It's found in his word. It's found in a walk with him. I don't know if that message challenges you, but it challenged me this summer. If I'm going to be able to sustain and stay active serving Christ and serving his word and making sure that I make a difference, my primary connection needs to first be with him. My source of living water needs to come from his word and what it offers me, and that way I can make a difference in the world. In church, we all need to be doing the same because our world needs us. Our world needs Christ. Our world needs the hope that's found in him. I hope that's a fair message for this morning. And if you're in this room and you've never known Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the first step you need to do is to talk to him and walk with him and give your life to him. Because that's the most important thing you could ever do, to have the resources you need to navigate this life. Because he is the word of life. He is uh, the bread of life. He is the good shepherd. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Come find him. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to preach to these special people, and I pray that your Holy Spirit will be mightily at work in the lives of those who are here and heard this word and translating it right into their lives. Father, I pray if there's any weeds that are going to choke out the seed this morning that you'd eliminate those weeds. Any worries that would choke out it, I pray you would eliminate those worries and help your word sow seeds in our life and produce 30, 60, some 100-fold, all to the praise of your glory so that we can make a difference in the world you want us to make. In Jesus' name, amen. I've got a friend Closer than a brother There is no judgment Oh, how he loves me I've got a friend And he is my strength he is my portion With me in the valley With me in the fire With me in the storm Let all my life Testify
Oh, hey, real quick, uh, Jonathan and Heather, if you want to, we have some uh, folks that are wanting to join our church. Yeah. This is Jonathan and Heather, and uh, they'd like to join our church today, so let's welcome them. I'll be back in the back if you want to say hi to them on the way out. Uh, also, there's a baptism right after the service. Uh, Kurt and Carmen Williamson are going to be baptized. And uh, then also the meeting uh, for the potential, uh, if you want to help uh, greet, that will be in here after the baptism. So thank you all. Thank you, guys.